Welcome to Season 7 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that's dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from around the globe who believe the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Today's episode is brought to you by Grand Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I am joined by Musa Bello, who goes by the nickname Sodium, and we'll ask about that, who is an empathy strategist, trainer, and coach with a passion to inspire people to live a fulfilling life. His mission is to inspire compassionate leadership, which led him to establish the Mubel Empathy Academy to help individuals and organizations, including the Federal Road Safety Corps of Nigeria and even the Ministry of Interior. And that he helped them leverage empathy to improve well being, performance, and build thriving relationships. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from the University of Abuja and believes the chemistry between people is the chemistry that really matters. I so love that. Um, and Sodium is on a journey to build a network of 10,000 plus global leaders making an impact in their respective fields. Welcome to the show, Sodium. Thank you, Dr. Anita Novak. <laughs> we've had a few uh, hits and misses trying to record this video, but we've stayed um, committed to this conversation, so I'm really excited. Um, let's start with a very simple question because I'm curious. Why the nickname Sodium? Oh, okay. So this nickname came before. By the way, let me appreciate you for having me. I'm so, so, so honored to be here with you today. So when I was in secondary school, you know, we were fond of writing popular players' names at the back of our sportswear. We had the sportswear for sports. So I was in Blue House back then in Federal Government Boys College in Abuja. So Many people were writing different players' names, like the popular ones then were Carlos, Lampard, Maluda, and, the, and different great players like that. But I just thought of it. Well, out of the blues, I just decided to write sodium at the back of my own jersey, at the back of my sportswear, and I put the 11, the atomic number there. I didn't just put any random number. And everybody was like, sodium, so I said, yes, that's what I want. I just wanted a unique name. Fast forward to that moment. All this while I wanted to study medicine. So all my ambition was I want to be a medical doctor, nothing else. But when I got to the university, there was a change of subject. And God willing, it was chemistry. So it was like I saw the future by choosing the nickname Sodium. But many people will think, is because of what I studied that the name came out from. But the name came before the course I studied. Beautiful. So, so I, t I take it you are a football fan? Exactly. Strong uh, Chelsea. A Chelsea fan. Oh, I'll have to tell my husband that. He's from Georgia, which is a rugby nation. But we, when we first started dating in the first year, uh, he told me it's his dream to go see a live football game during FIFA, even though he's not a huge fan of FIFA as an organization because it's full of corruption. Um, he still wanted to see the, sh the, the, the players. So we actually went, I think the year was 2014 in South America and Brazil. So we yes. actually, we went to see, um, you know, we, we were there during the time that the FIFA World Cup was happening. But we managed to find one ticket for him to see an actual live game in Belo Horizonte. And we were nervous because a lot of people were being caught for holding um, counterfeit tickets. Um, but we bought one from a local and he ran, he missed the first 20 minutes of the game, but he ran, you know, up to the stadium praying that he wasn't going to have a counterfeit ticket because a lot of people were being hauled off to prison. He got to the game. It was a great, great seat right behind the opposing team's net. So the game was Brazil, and I wanna say Chile, I could be wrong, but I think it was Chile. It went into overtime, double overtime, penalty kicks, and Brazil wow. won. So he came out and he was floating on air, um, and that will always remain a, like a, a great memory. I'm very curious when everybody, when anybody is working in the field of empathy development and leadership and culture building, what is the backstory and what does empathy mean to you? Okay. 
Empathy to me is the bedrock of innovation and peace in any society. So basically empathy is just for you to be able to understand what is going on with the next person. And the job for you to understand does not mean you will get 100% picture, but because you are curious enough, you can get to 90 or 95 mm -hmm. at most. That's, it depends on how curious you can be. So for me, the backstory will be, I've seen uh, growing up, I've been on the side of like, my second school is a big, huge part of my story. I was this kid that was, uh, people thought I was an extro extrovert. Uh, same way that I thought, I thought I was an extrovert, but I was an introvert. Hmm. Why was I showing up like an extrovert? I wanted to be seen, heard, and understood by all means. Hmm. So I felt me jumping everywhere would be the best way for me to show who I am or what I can yeah you know, what I what I can share with people. So but I realized that after several years, after my university days, I did some reflection and I was like, okay, why was I struggling to be aired by others? It means there must be something that needs to be learned so that everybody can be who they are without trying to show up for, every, for them to look interesting. Just by who you are, you can be interesting enough for people to listen to your story. So that was when I started on learning certain things about myself. Back then, I would joke with virtually everything. There was no thin line between the serials, the, you know, I was just masking everything just to be interesting to everyone. But empathy has shown me that I don't need to show up in an interesting way because I'm already interesting with who I am. If I'm comfortable with myself, others will be comfortable with me. Mm. And I can now connect with them and vice versa. So that's basically what led me to empathy. And empathy will not be possible if we don't master our emotions. So what comes up for me when you're talking, I mean, that's a lot of insights, right? That's a lot of introspection. Um, and I imagine that, you know, there are a lot of leaders in positions right now who still feel that they need to prove themselves, either based on like the family they grew up in, or maybe the role that they have, uh, or, or maybe because, you know, they're reporting to a somebody and they feel like there's competition between somebody else in a different role, all sorts of psychological reasons why we feel like we have to perform. But I think what I'm hearing you say is even leaders will become better leaders if the more work that they do to realize that, you know, they, they should be grounded in their, in a sense of self. And then as a way of being interesting to others is actually to be curious about others and to listen. Exactly. Exactly. You just put it beautifully. So we don't need to perform. All we need to be is just to be ourselves. Mm -hmm. Our stories are interesting enough. Our personalities are interesting enough. And when you take the, uh, take the focus away from yourself, you will find out that, wow, there's a lot to learn from others. There was one, I was reading a book, uh, Why Empathy Matters. I don't know if you have come across that book. I read about where they had human libraries in Denmark, I think. Instead of going to borrow books, quote, unquote, you can borrow human beings for about 30 minutes or more. You just take a walk with them and just express yourself to them. What they are just doing is they are listening. No judgment because they don't even know who you are. And you are not trying to impress them. No feeling like that. When you know you are speaking and the person is understanding what you're saying and the person is not trying to uh, interrupt you or trying to prove that what you said is right or wrong. And it gives you that, uh, that sense of belonging that you are the master of your own experience. Mm -hmm. You just express and the person just listens and say, okay, I hear you. 
Can you share more with me? And I appreciate that you are sharing your story with me. So basically, how is it? Yeah, I love that. I mean, it speaks to, again, the power of listening and how poorly we listen, um, I've discovered, uh, myself included, right? So it's a practice to listen and really hold space for people. Why do you think empathy is so important to relationships? I mean, within the family, within the community, uh, within the workplace? Okay, relationship can be dynamic, but there's something I would key anytime I'm thinking about relationship. You, I'm sure you know about relay race. It's a type of race where you exchange button, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how I spell my relationship. I put a Y at the back of that A, R-E-L-A-Y. -E then I spell the rest. Anytime I remember relay, I know it's an exchange of button. At some point, you may be leading the conversation. Some point, I may be following. So when we are exchanging our needs, our wants, our feelings, in a non-judgmental way, we are winning the race. And I see it as a relay race, not as a marathon, where you have to endure after trying to communicate your needs and the person is not getting the message. So no matter the relationship, the key thing there is honest and open conversation. When we listen to other people's feelings, it's not because their feelings is superior, but because it is valid. That's why we have to listen to them. Mm -hmm. And when they are sharing their story, it's not because it's superior or inferior, because it is as important as us, then we create that time and space to listen and learn from them. That's beautiful. Okay, so I have two really pressing follow-up questions to all our conversation. Um, the first one is, you mentioned that you wanted to be a medical doctor and then you studied chemistry and now you're doing this work in empathy. So I want to know what happened, the journey. And now given what you've just shared and how much um, depth and insight and, and obviously thought you've put into your concept. And I love the idea of adding a why to relationship. I think I'm going to use that from now on. I'll, 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 I'll make sure to quote you. Um, I want to know how it's changed your life. You know, you have these concepts and you must be coaching people. I can appreciate that. But how has it changed your own personal relationships? All right. The, when, I, when I introduce myself as an empathy strategist, it humbles me a lot because it constantly reminds me that I am a card-carrying member of empathy. It's not just about what I say to organizations. I'm constantly expressing it in what I do and in what I say. So basically for me, you talked about my uh, dream to become a medical doctor. I believe it all came from that genuine love to alleviate people's suffering. Mm. That's where the whole love came from. So over the years, because here in Nigeria, you have to apply and if you don't get the course, then you will be offered another course entirely. But and because I was very good in chemistry, I jumped on it. I was like, okay, fine. Let's see what we can do with this. So chemistry is a study of reaction between, uh, between matter, right? Physical and chemical properties of matter. We are constantly studying relationship, but not until I graduated from chemistry. That was when I finally appreciated the course because I was seeing its application in my own life and the relationship I have with others. Mm. For instance, my favorite uh, definition of human being is human beings are many making creatures, mm. accepting and processing words and action to give them meaningful information. And I constantly say that chemicals react human beings respond. Mm -hmm. So I always see that connection between what I studied and what I'm constantly practicing, which is teaching people empathy and coaching people how to master their emotions and relationship. In my own personal life, I'm constantly saying, what can I improve on? Is it my listening? Is it how I communicate my feelings? Is it how I sit down with my own feelings without judgment? I'm constantly dancing between 
all these areas to see how I can constantly improve. Beautiful. Oh my gosh, love it. Today's episode was brought to you by Grand Here and International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. So how can we lead with empathy? Okay. Leaders, basically, the job of a leader is to take care of the people in their charge. It's not to lead people to, uh, to do tasks. It's to lead those people. Then those people will undo the task. Mm. When you are leading with empathy, you are constantly thinking, am I creating the emotional climate for people to perform at their best? Because there, is, there are three questions people are constantly asking when they are following a leader. Am I being heard? Am I being understood? Do I have a sense of belonging? If they don't feel any of these three, they don't feel connected to you. And you have to buy their art before you sell them your vision. So that way, when you communicate with them, they will understand that, okay, we are together in this. And the job of followers is to make their leaders shine. And the job of a leader is to always ensure that he gives all the accolades to the followers. That way, everybody wins. And and we're experiencing empathy desert in most of the companies I train because they're just about the numbers, right? They don't care about the people that drive the numbers. And I'm like, what can you do with the numbers when the people are not motivated and connected and feeling like, okay, we are together in this. And every outcome that comes out of this is for the benefit and the good of all in the company. Leaders basically should just behave like Google Map. When you use your Google Map, right? When you miss the road, when you miss the town you are supposed to pass, Google Map does not yell, Hey, hey, Sodium, you just missed your turn. What a stupid boy you are. What a... Google Map doesn't do that. What Google Map will just do is show you the next direction, redirect. Okay, there is another route here. Why don't you follow that? Last, we have to behave like Google Maps when we are leading people. And we have to see leadership as a privilege, not as a right. And leaders should bring up leaders, not followers. Oh, wow. That was rich. Um, Thank you for that. And in terms of a culture of empathy, how can a culture of empathy transform an organization? Okay. Culture basically is a way of life of a group of people, right? Mm -hmm. So if empathy is, and when I'm talking about empathy, I'm not talking about what you just write on your wall and say our core values, empathy. I mean, are the leaders showcasing the empathy? When they walk past a subordinate or a colleague, do they bother to look at that colleague and say, how are you doing? How are you doing on your job? Is there any way I can help? When they, just these little things. And when somebody is celebrating as little as, let's say, a birthday, Everybody just loves that person and celebrates them in the office. Let me share a quick story with you. A friend of mine back then in secondary school is is currently trying to change his job. Not because the pay is not right, but because the boss is always, I'm calling him a boss now, not a leader, because there are two different things. Because the boss is constantly trying to push on the emotion is experiencing to others. He doesn't care if he's feeling angry or anxious. He wants everybody to receive a dose of it. And guess what? My friend was celebrating his birthday. He did not even have the courage to share with his colleagues in the workplace that that day was his birthday. The day just went like a normal day. You and I know how we all love to, at least, even if it's just that birthday, we want to celebrate it, whether with a cake or champagne or what have you. So when you are in a workplace where you don't feel appreciated or seen, 
heard or understood, your well-being doesn't matter, then they are not practicing culture of empathy. And the leading cause of people changing jobs now, before it used to be, I want better pay, but now it is, I want peace and I want a non-toxic environment to share what I have. So that's where culture of empathy plays a role. Everybody feels connected and they feel like they matter. That's the key. The thread that I'm picking up from our conversation, and it started from the very beginning, is this idea of self-awareness. So I feel that in your perspective, you know, empathy is available to us all, but the precursor to empathy is having some self-awareness so that you don't actually, you're not reactive all the time, but there's this little pregnant pause and making decisions about how you want to be in the world and how you want to be in relation to others. One of the interesting things that I'd like to pick your brain about as somebody who has studied chemistry is um, how embodied our feelings are. And, and if you could speak to that, right? Because I feel like our emotions are not something cognitive. Our emotions happen to our physical body. So what have you got to say about that? Okay. Emotions are biochemical reactions released in the body as a response to stimulus. Mm -hmm. So, but one of my favorite definitions of emotions is emotions are energy in motion. Mm -hmm. Emotions are energy. When you're excited, how do you feel? You feel energized. When you feel disappointed or something like that, all the energy just feel like they are, they've gone somewhere. And the good thing, like, like you just said, emotions are embodied. For every point in time, there are biochemicals released in the body. As we are talking, when you enjoy my conversation, you release certain almost in the body. These are biochemical reactions. Like adrenaline is responsible for the stress hormone, and you know, but uh, cortisol rather. Adrenaline when we are angry for uh, fight or flight mode and all of that. But when you deliberately and one good act about feeling good without trying to distract yourself from feelings is knowing that you can activate these hormones naturally. Mm -hmm. For instance, oxytocin. Is the hormone is released when we connect with people. When we connect with people, how do we feel? Especially our loved ones. We feel good, right? We don't pay for that. And we feel good about it. When, you, when we exercise, endorphin is released. How do we feel? We feel good. Mm -hmm. We may not want to go for that exercise, but after it, I'm yet to see somebody that is Engaging in exercise and is feeling anxious and grumpy at the same time. I'm here to meet that person. That yeah, is you, and you know what you make me think of is we're all walking around with phones as an extension to our appendage of our hand. We're sucked into the doom scrolling and we are not connecting. We're not doing enough human to human connection of what you know really matters that allows those endorphins and allows those good hormones to flow. And we need to, because it turns out our lives are enriched when we do it. So exactly. yeah, and I think, I think what you've really put a pin on is that we need to pay more attention to how our bodies are feeling as a way of teaching ourselves how we're feeling emotionally so that we can actually react with you know, a certain degree of emotional intelligence. Exactly, exactly. And you know, you, uh, emotions has three aspects. The cognitive, the affective, and the behavioral. Mm. So cognitive is what am I thinking? Affective is how do I feel about it? And what you are thinking is not as important as the meaning you attach to it. That was mm -hmm. why my, I defined that human beings are meaning-making creatures. Nothing else we do apart from just making meaning. So if I look at you and I say, and my meaning that attached to it is I'm saying an enemy or a racist, mm -hmm. and we feel a kind of emotion in my body, that's what leads to the affective part, how I feel. Then it will now lead to the behavioral aspect. What am I going to do? Will I shout? Will I yell? Will I walk up to you and give you a big hug? You know? So 
they are constantly connected. But people try to, people think thoughts, feelings, and action are in a chronological manner. Of course not. They can work either ways. Action can affect your feelings, can affect your thoughts, either ways. So if you know this act, you can just, from not feeling so good, you can just click an action and it will, you know, when you exercise, regardless of what you were thinking, the feeling will change and the thoughts will be different. And you say, I'm feeling good about myself. That's so true. And, you know, I teach at McGill, I teach a bunch of different courses. So obviously the content is different, but one of the message that I like to relay to my students, and I always see like these little light bulb moments go on, is that we are all meaning making machines, as you just said, right? That's what human beings are. But we're, yeah. we're, ma we're making meaning of what's going on in our lives through our thoughts. And we yes. never challenge our thoughts. We accept our thoughts as the truth, but who's to say that what we're thinking is correct? Like maybe let's, let's be curious about it. Are we right? Like ask the question, did I get this? Or am I understanding this correctly? And I think a lot can be debunked if we really question ourselves a bit more. Yes, because at every point in time, we are constantly talking to ourselves. Yeah. And we need to ask, when I have the thought now, I'm asking, is it a fact? Yeah. Is it empowering me? Yeah. Will it lead me to achieve my goals and build meaningful relationships? If my answer is no, 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 I know it's time for me to drop it. Because if I, if I make a mistake and I don't get what I want, if I call myself a failure, that's not a fact. It's a lie. It's a big fat lie. Mm -hmm. But most times that's how we judge ourselves. And we don't just see it as, okay, I didn't get that right. What's my next attempt? And we go for that. So yeah. that's how we need to be engaging ourselves. And I think social media plays a big role. And so does the general landscape of a very, very consumerist culture that wants to sell us things because we're deficient, that the self-talk is just getting increasingly, increasingly negative. And we really have to have some breakthroughs to... To, to, to lift ourselves up, not to pump ourselves up so that we're better than others, but to really kind of sense that by virtue of having been born, we come with values. Uh, you know, we, we come as valuable, you know, and we have to kind of own that. So, but that's a process. Exactly, it's a process. And it takes practice, just like empathy takes practice. So we're coming to the end of our conversation, and this is one of my favorite questions to ask, and I love ending on such a sweet note, but I wonder if you can think of a time in your life where you were on the receiving end of empathy, and what I call purposeful empathy, right? So somebody's acting, on, em acting with empathy on purpose to, you know, to be there for you. Um, what was that experience, and what was that like for you? Okay, for me, I would say my mom is the first empathy ambassador I ever met. So I remember when I'm maybe, for instance, I'm struggling with my studies or when I finished university, when I was trying to get a job before I was able to build up my own, she would just sit with me. And when I'm talking, she's like, okay, everything will be fine. I'm here with you. You know, no judgment, no pressure. And she was just, okay, okay. So she was the first person that we just, and she, just by looking at my face, I know many mothers are gifted on that. She could just read what is going on in my head and she won't conclude. She will still ask, so what's on your mind? You know, that gives me that, okay, she's not just trying to act like she's a magician here. Yeah, she also wants to know what's going on with me. And she shares her own perspective and I love your concept about purposeful empathy because when there is no purpose, then it's not useful, right? Mm -hmm. So the purpose is to constantly build connection and to improve our well being. I think that's the basic core about uh, empathy improve well being, improve innovation, and constantly improve relationships. Mm -hmm. so. Well, a shout out to your mom, who's obviously been a model and a case study for you to learn from in terms of showing up as someone who is now coaching and advising others on how to 
to behave and, and be with empathy. So thank you so much, Busa. It was so lovely to meet you. And uh, this has been a really rich conversation. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Anita. You are doing a great job. Please keep it up. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you all for watching. We'll see you next week uh, at Purposeful Empathy. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free from your thinking clutter, make that important decision, or liberate you from whatever is holding you back? At Grand Here and International, you get to choose the coach of your choice anytime from anywhere. Visit International.com and harness the power of on-demand coaching today.